all here to hear about rocks today, right? Rocks. Yeah? Okay, okay, okay. How about Mars rocks? Yeah. So about half of my title, geologist, not very exciting, right? But Martian geologist, that's a bit better. So that's where I really, uh, that's where I go for. And I'm going to talk a bit, oops, oh, there you go. So what is it about Mars? Why do we hear so much about Mars in the media? Does it just have a really good PR manager? Given that there's, there's 5,000 other planets that we've learned about outside of our solar system, there's eight planets in our own solar system, there's dozens of moons, other dwarf planets, why is it Mars gets all the attention compared to anywhere else? I mean, I'm obviously interested in it. Mars is great for me because there's nothing else on the surface. There's no life, there's no water. It's perfect, I can just see the rocks everywhere I look. But hopefully maybe I can convince you that it is worth looking at. It is interesting. And one of the reasons is it all comes down to one really important thing. There's only one planet we've ever found in the universe that has evidence of life. No surprise, you're here. And this is on a really long way, roundabout way of thinking. This is why we're really interested in Mars as well. Because we'd really like to find life somewhere else other than the Earth. And because Earth is the only planet that we know of with life, that's, that's our starting point. So we say, Earth has life. What does Earth have that makes life possible here? So this is just a simple list of really, really basic things. Earth has a solid surface. That's great. Something for life to grab onto. Protection under rocks, inside rocks. You know, life just wants to grab hold of something. It needs something to stand on. Also, Earth has a really thick atmosphere. And that protects us from a lot of radiation, from coming from the sun and from elsewhere. But it also just keeps this temperature on the surface of Mars, or on the surface of Earth. See, I'm slipping already. Surface of Earth really stable. So that's really important, we think, for life. It's just having a nice, thick atmosphere for life to live in. And as we just learned, life needs a lot of water. How would we, how would we pee so much if we didn't have all that water in us? So obviously, we need, we need water to live. And every, all bits of life that we find on Earth have a lot of water in them. We're made up of mostly water. So that shouldn't come as a surprise either. And then a trickier one is life needs a source of energy. And we get our energy from eating food, right? But if you really look back and you trace it back, where does all that energy actually come from? Most of it's coming from the sun. We, there are some bits of life on Earth that live off heat coming from volcanoes, vents under the ocean, <coughs> vents under the ocean. But for the most part, life on Earth gets its heat and all of the energy that comes into us eventually from the sun. So given all these things, given these criteria, where else might we look for life? Well, I'm going to firstly discount just about all those other 5,000 other planets that we found are outside of the solar system. Because unfortunately, they're just too far away. Even the closest ones are a couple light years away. And that's just too far. It's too far for us to go just yet. And even with our biggest telescopes, is that really too far to see any detail? So within our own solar system, how can we start to narrow it down? There's a lot of planets and a lot of moons. Which ones, which ones do we want to focus our attention on to look for life? Hopefully we can all agree the sun, not a great place. Not a great place for life. Uh, and for similar reasons, we could probably say the gas giants in the outer solar system are not great. And again, that's kind of because they don't have a solid surface. Maybe somewhere in the atmosphere, maybe there's the right gases or the right combination of things that could make life possible, but there's nowhere for it to grab hold of. There's nowhere for it to really start. So I'm going to just take those out of the equation as well. Next. I'm going to remove anything that doesn't have an atmosphere on the surface, because we're pretty sure that's going to be pretty important for life. So we've already narrowed it down a lot from all the different bodies in the solar system. So we've got about three planets in the inner solar system and four moons. 
a couple are moons of Jupiter, and a couple are moons of Saturn. So when you look at them all in a group, these are all to scale against each other. There's a huge variety of shape and color and size of these different moons and planets. So let's just uh, let's go through them one by one, uh, or in groups, and see what, what potential they might have for life. So Io, Io and Europa are moons of Jupiter, and Enceladus and Titan are moons of Saturn. Enceladus and Europa, I've included here, kind of am cheating. They don't actually have atmospheres, but what we do see is they have an icy crust around the planet, or around the moon, and underneath that, we're pretty sure there's an ocean of liquid water. So uh, maybe I'm cheating a little bit, but I think that's probably still, still a pretty good place to look. Io is pretty interesting. It's got a really thick atmosphere, but it's very volcanic. Maybe not a great place to look for life. Could be quite dangerous there. And Titan. Titan is really cool in more ways than one. So it has, you can see on the surface, those dark areas on it. Those are actually seas and lakes. And you can see the haze. It has a really thick atmosphere. That seems like the number one place, seas and lakes and oceans of liquid. What a great place to look for life, except there's a catch. That liquid that makes up these seas is actually methane and other hydrocarbons. And this really brings around the big problem for looking for life in the outer solar system. It's so cold there. It's so cold that on the surface of Titan, rocks are essentially made of ice, and the liquid around them is made of hydrocarbons, something that's normally a gas here on Earth. So it's just too cold. They get too little light from the sun all the way out there. And also, I'm going to look past them right now because it does take a long time to get to them. To get to the outer solar system, missions usually take five, maybe 10 years, depending what route they take. Whereas to get somewhere on the inner solar system, you're looking at more six to nine months, something like that. So these are three planets in the inner solar system. Let's, say, let's take a look at them. Venus looks pretty interesting. It's almost the exact same size as Earth. You can see from the, the pictures, actually, we can't even see the surface of it. It's all cloud. But when we look at the surface with radar, we actually can see what's down there. And it's not a nice place, really not a nice place. It is so hot that lead will melt on the surface. And the pressure around you is so great that it's, it's like being a mile underwater. Not a great place for life currently. Maybe there was life in the past on Venus and something went wrong. That's very possible. There's theories that Venus maybe had an ocean in the past. But when we look at the surface of Venus, all we can see is very recent volcanic flows across the surface. So whatever evidence there might be for a climate that was, col uh, was uh, colder and wetter in the past is gone. It's kind of been washed away. It's been covered up. So that's a really difficult place to look. What about Earth? OK. Yeah, we know there's lots of life here. We can move on. And that really leaves one place that is close by and ticks a lot of the boxes of life and what we're looking for. So why is it? Why, why Mars? Well, even though it's quite different from the Earth in terms of climate now, compared to anywhere else in the solar system, it may be one of the places that's closest to the Earth. We'll get a, we'll get a bit more into that later. But it's also really likely that the conditions on Mars were much more like Earth in the past. So a place with, that was warmer and wetter, had oceans, possibly. But there's something else that gets overlooked a little bit. There's kind of urgency to go to Mars sooner rather than later. And that's because it's so close to Earth, it's probably the next planet that humans will visit themselves. At the moment, we send robots there, and we do our best to make sure that those robots are decontaminated so that they don't take life from Earth that might grow on Mars. And then, how would you distinguish the two? How would you say, we found life on Mars, but did it, was it here already, or did we bring it with us? So, we can do a pretty good job of sterilizing a rover. You can't do that with a human. As soon as we send humans to Mars, it's going to be really difficult to not contaminate the planet with 
all of our human bacteria. We come along, we come with a whole host, a civilization of other life forms on us. So we've got to be really careful that when we go to Mars, we don't let that escape into the wild. So I hope maybe you've, I've convinced you Mars is the place to look. So how are we actually going to do that? Well, a couple hundred years ago, the best way to look at Mars was, well, being an old white guy with a beard. And you needed a big telescope, probably a big beard as well. He's, he's got a pretty good one. But this was really the only way to look at Mars. And not even that. You couldn't just look at Mars any night. The way the planets orbit around the sun, Mars and Earth only come really close to each other once every two years. And it's only for about a period of two weeks that we can get really good views of Mars from the Earth. So during that time, a couple hundred years ago, all the scientists would point their telescopes at Mars. And this is roughly what they would see. This is a modern photograph, obviously, but it's taken with about an 8-inch telescope, something anyone can get. You could use this in your back garden. And this is approximately what they would have seen with those early telescopes. So what kind of guesses did they make about what it was like on the surface of Mars? What were the chances for life there? Well, I think the best way to make this comparison, this is probably one of my favorite pictures of the Earth. This is a picture of the Earth taken with a similar-sized telescope that I showed you that picture of Mars. But this one is actually taken from orbit around Mars. One of the satellites that usually takes pictures of the surface of Mars turned its camera upward into the sky and instead took a picture of, Mars, of Earth. So when we compare these two images beside each other, it's a really good way to get an idea of how they made early guesses about what the surface of Mars was like. They saw a white patch at the bottom. They thought, oh, that's probably, uh, that's probably an ice cap, just like we have on Earth. They were right about that. And then they went a bit farther, and they said, well, oceans on the Earth would look really dark from space, and the continents would look uh, a bit brown and, and lighter colored. So they made the same guess. But they said, well, that's probably what we're seeing on Mars as well. So this is, this is a really old map from the 1800s that they made of the surface of Mars. And they've mapped it in, with seas and oceans in green. And they thought that's what they were looking at when they looked through their telescopes. They were looking at a planet that was wet and had oceans on the surface and lots of water. And that turned out to not be correct. But they were doing the best they could. To get anything better, we had to wait another 100 years until the, until the 1960s, when, the first, uh, when Mariner 4, the first satellite to fly very close to Mars and actually get pictures near the surface. And right up until this satellite launched, scientists weren't sure what we would find. They thought maybe we'd see vegetation on the surface. They thought maybe we'd see water on the surface. And it was a bit of a letdown. The surface actually looked more like the moon just covered in craters, and nothing very, uh, nothing recent, nothing that looked new, like there had been any activity there geologically. Since then, it's gotten a bit better. So in order of arrival, these are all the spacecraft that are at Mars currently. There have been dozens over the years. These are just the ones that are actually there right now. And there's a lot. There's a lot. One of the things that maybe I think would be surprising is just how many satellites there are around Mars. So the rovers are the real celebrities on Mars. We love them. They take selfies of themselves. We give them cute names like Percy. And we love to see them. It makes it real. It makes Mars a real place that you could stand on. But I think the real unsung heroes of Mars are the satellites. So let's just have a look at what kind of images we can get, get of Mars just from the satellites alone. So th this is by far my favorite picture of Mars, and it's a real lucky shot. A lot of the pictures we have of Mars, the satellites are really close because they want to get detailed pictures of the surface. This one 
was actually taken not by a satellite that was in orbit of Mars, but by the Rosetta mission, which was a satellite on its way to meet up, a, meet up with a comet. And it had to fly by Mars as part of its mission, and it snapped a couple pictures as it went by. But it gives us this beautiful, in one image, the whole surface of Mars. And now we can see a bit in bit better detail what those ancient astronomers were actually looking, looking at. OK, the polar ice cap definitely looks like a polar ice cap still. You can even see some wisps of cloud around the edge. So it probably has an atmosphere. And you can see now in a bit better detail the dark and pale areas on the surface. But now, at this detail, they don't look like so much like oceans and continents. It looks like maybe just different colored rocks on the surface. To give you an idea of what size we're looking at here, this is a map of Europe, pasted on the top. But I'm really interested. I want to zoom in on where this division is between the dark and light areas on Mars. So now we can zoom in to a bit better detail. And we can actually see in the south side of this picture, there's a lot of craters. And in the north side, there's very few craters. And that's one of the ways we tell how old the surfaces are on Mars. So maybe, maybe they were right. Maybe they had a good idea about there being water on one side of the planet in oceans and continents on the other. But we'll have to zoom in a little bit more to actually be sure. Oh, and again, here's Bulgaria. We won't actually move Bulgaria to Mars yet. We'll see. <laughs> but let's zoom in on this crater right in the middle. Craters are great places to look at for geology. Now we're getting some good detail. We can really see a lot. This is actually taken by a thermal camera. So it can actually tell us about how the rock temperatures change from day to night. And we can actually tell a lot about what those rocks are made of because of how the temperature changes. But today, we're just going to look at it in terms of a nice image. And something that jumps out to me as a geologist, first, first off, if you think about it, this is the hands of a clock. At around 8 o'clock on there, there's a little squiggly line that breaks the edge of the crater. That looks exactly like a valley that was carved by water flowing into the crater. And where'd that water go? Did it come out of the crater? Mm, I don't know. Maybe the, maybe the crater filled up and was a lake at one point. But I'm going to be real mean now. This is super villain-esque. You're all on Mars now. Sorry. If any of you didn't want to go, apologies. But let's zoom in. Let's zoom in a little bit further. OK. Now, as a geologist, I'm going to skip over a lot of this because I'm getting very excited about the rocks I'm seeing. I can see a lot more detail. But I know I can't bring everyone along with me for that. And this, is, uh, this, this imagery that we're looking at now is from a camera called CTX. And we actually have 95% of the planet covered with this resolution of imagery. And it's pretty much as good as you get Google Earth here on Earth. And you can just browse it. Anyone can browse these pictures on the internet. But let's zoom in a bit further. Ah, yes. This looks good. And I'm starting to see some interesting shapes. See that uh, kind of squiggly line? It looks like a ridge. I think, as a geologist, I think that's going to be a great place to go and look at the rocks. I just want to see what they're made of. Are they layered? How did they form? What are they? What are they? So let's zoom in again. Ah, oh, that's good. I'm really enjoying this now. And now we can actually see dark patches as well. But I'm not sure what they are. And this is still CTX imagery. So we're talking about this is the whole, you can almost see the entire planet at this resolution. But I really want to look at this ridge, because I think I can see some layers in the rocks. Now, this is a beautiful camera that we have that orbits Mars called HiRISE. And we only have about uh, maybe 5% of the surface mapped with this camera. But man, is it good. We get color, and I can actually start to make out individual layers in the rocks. And for geologists, that's really important, because the way rocks are laid down, one on top of the other over time, each one is like the page of a book. And if you can look at them all exposed together, it's like reading through history. And you can see what happened at a particular place a long time ago. And there you go. OK, it was a bit mean to put all of, so of uh, Sophia there. So just us. Wave to, wave to the spacecraft. 
But I really want to zoom in on this area because, as I was saying, you know, I want to look at the edge of this ridge of rocks to see if there's layers there. But there's also a really interesting area. See that dark patch kind of at the top of that black square? I want to see what that is as well. Ah, this is really interesting. It might be a bit hard to see on this imagery, but that black patch is actually a patch of sand. And you can see maybe just some little ripples on the surface. And that actually forms in the same way that sand dunes in a desert do here on Earth. And why is it black? Where everywhere else around it is kind of a reddish color. Well, the surface of Mars, we see it as all red, and we think of it as the red planet, but it's literally skin deep. Underneath a thin, thin coating of dust, all the rocks, most of them, are kind of black. It's basaltic, volcanic rocks. So in a place where there's sand dunes being blown back and forth across the surface, that actually appears to be black, because that's the actual color of the rocks. But there's something else that sticks out to me in this, in this photo. What's that? There's a, really bright, there's a really bright rock or boulder or something here. And it just so happens we actually have a pretty good image of this spot. <laughs> this is the Curiosity rover. And as you may know, it's in the center of Gale Crater, which we actually know was a lake bed, partially from all of these beautiful photos that we have from orbit. You know, it's great what we can see with the rover, but being able to tie it all in together and say, well, we can see what the rover's looking at. There's some interesting rocks there. But look, in the background, you can actually see the sand dunes to one side there. You can actually see the layers in the rock that we were looking at from orbit. And having the context of where the rover is on the scale of the planet makes it so much more useful to us in terms of science. And just to show off, Let's just zoom in one more time. And this is about as far as you can go. This is a tiny little drill hole that the rover made in the surface. It's about a centimeter across. And if you see those little white lines running through the rock, we know, because the rover was there and tested these rocks, those minerals actually only form in the presence of water. So it's perfect. We've got it on a big scale. We see a river flowing into this crater. We think it's a lake. The rover goes, and it finds chemical evidence that, yes, there was, there was a body of water here. I think that's the most exciting thing. So if we know all this about Mars, we've got all these satellites and these rovers on the surface, what's it actually like on Mars today? And again, I apologize for bringing you all there and the rest of Sophia. They didn't know it. But it's a horrible place. <laughs> it is really horrible. And there's a famous saying that space tries to kill you in a thousand ways. Mars is no different, except that Mars might make you think that it's a bit safer there. It might look a bit more similar to the Earth, but it's not, it's not a nice place. It's very, very dry. It's worse than any desert on Earth. The air is thinner than the top of any mountain on Earth. There's nothing to breathe. However, we do know that there's an atmosphere. This is, try, try to get your perspective right on this one, but this is a satellite imagery of a dust devil or a small tornado on the surface of Mars. So that shows us that there must be an atmosphere on the surface with air blowing around, wind, creating wind and weather. And Mars actually has different seasons. There's actually a whole dust season that obscures the entire planet's surface in dust storms. And these, are, these dust devils seem to be really common on the surface. And we actually capture them with rovers as well. I believe this is a picture from Opportunity. It just so happened to catch a little tornado in the background of its image there. Something else that Mars has going for it in terms of similarity to Earth, it may be a very dry desert, but dry doesn't necessarily mean that there's no water there. There is lots of water on Mars. It's just all frozen, as far as we can see. So this is an orbital image of the, so of the south polar ice cap on Mars. And it looks a lot like a polar ice cap on Earth. Just white, lots of snow, essentially. Something that's interesting about this, though, is most of the ice cap is made up of, liquid, or of frozen water ice, so H2O, layered with dust. And that pretty much stays there all year long. 
the little white skim that we see on top is seasonal, but that's actually carbon dioxide ice. So something that exists as a gas here on Earth, it's so cold on Mars that it exists as a solid, and it changes from north to south as the seasons change on Mars. So you do, again, you get some, some sort of weather. So that's not very encouraging, is it, for a place where we might find life. There's a lot of radiation on the surface. It's very cold and dry. And all the water's frozen. Not great. What we do think, though, is that Mars was very different in the past. So why, why do we think that? Not to bring you too down the rabbit hole of geology here, but we, do, we use something called terrestrial analogs. And this is when we see something, a shape, a landform, or a mountain or something on another planet. And we say, well, that looks a lot like a similar feature that we've seen on Earth. And when we see something that looks really similar in shape and form on another planet the, to something we see on Earth, we make the assumption that, OK, well, these things probably form by the same processes. So even if those processes don't work on Mars anymore. So here's a really good example. This is an example of a valley system on Mars and a valley system on Earth. Any guess which is which? Up or down? Hands up for up? And for down? Oh, it's kinda, it's a, there's a giveaway on these, but the red one looks like it should be Mars. But the real giveaway is all the craters on the one at the top. And that one is actually the image of Mars. But this is really interesting to us because the form of these features is so similar, with small tributaries winding along, meeting up with a central valley, which flows downhill towards something. And this is one of the reasons that we are sure that there used to be water flowing on the surface of Mars, because a river system on Earth looks so similar to the valley systems that we see on Mars. So we think that that's very good evidence that there used to be water on the surface. Beyond that, maybe we can say that there's not just water flowing across the surface, but there was enough water to form uh, possibly lakes or oceans. And one way that we can look at that is through a feature called deltas. So a delta on Earth is formed when a river flowing down reaches a coast. And as soon as, the, as, soon as the, all the sediment that the river's carrying, as soon as it reaches the coast, all that momentum that it has moving forward stops. And all the sand and silt stops and is deposited. And the valley splits out into these different for forking branches. Excuse me. And we see the exact same thing again on Mars. See a valley winding its way across the surface. In this case, it gets to the edge of a crater. And then, presto, you have the exact same thing forming. And we think this is really good evidence that not only are there rivers on Mars, there are also lakes. Going even further, this one's a bit harder to see. But we can also, also actually see shorelines on ancient Mars. So this one's a bit tricky. The one at the bottom is from an area called the Great Salt Lake in uh, North America. And we can see these kind of lines that go concentrically all the way around. And these are formed at the edge of a lake where waves keep hitting the edge, and they make a step. And in this case, the lake kept drying up, and each time it dried up, it formed a new step all the way down to the center. So we see these lines, these ancient shorelines. And on the top, we're pretty sure we see it on Mars as well. This is a bit harder to see, but take my word for it. And when we put all of these things together, we can really compare what the surface of Mars looks like today and bring it all together and say what Mars looked like in the past. And if you'll excuse me, this is another supervillain moment. I'm going to, just for the sake of science, I'm going to take all the life and all the water off Earth and see what's left and map some of these things on the Earth. So this is the topography of the Earth, so the ups and downs, the hills and troughs and valleys. And I've actually mapped on here all the big river systems and most of the big lakes in the world. And it may sound a bit obvious to say, but we can actually make some interesting ideas about the patterns that these are in. Again, it may sound really obvious, but there's no lakes or rivers in the bottom of the sea. It, which, again, is obvious on Earth. 
But now, if we look at a map of Mars, suddenly that becomes a bit more significant. We can actually see another map here with lakes as blue dots and rivers in, as green lines. But notice something, they all stop. All of these systems of rivers stop before they get to the north. And it's very smooth and flat there, almost like uh, the bottom of the ocean looked like on the map of the Earth. And it turns out this is a really interesting place to look at on the surface of Mars. Here's the locations of a few rovers. Perseverance, Curiosity are already within lakes at, right on this line. And ExoMars, which unfortunately won't be launching this year, It'll launch again in a few years, hopefully, is again right on this line. It's a really interesting part of Mars to look at because we're not certain, but it looks like it might be the coastline of an ancient ocean that filled the north half of the planet. So this gets a bit into my work now. So, I just looked at a very relatively small area on the surface of Mars, probably about the size of Western Europe. And this is only like 3% of the planet. And I thought, if I look at this area in real, real detail, because we've got all of these images of 95% of the surface, maybe I can find a few more lakes than have been noticed there before. Because previous research, they found about 20 lakes in this area that I'm looking at. So the way I did this, I went around and I mapped all of these things that I just mentioned to you. I mapped all the river valleys, I mapped where there's deltas, and I mapped where there are possible shorelines. And then to add lakes to that, that's the tricky bit. Then I needed a map of the topography of the surface. Where are there hollows on the surface? Where are there mountains? Where would water flow and pool if it was, if it was flowing across the surface? To give you an example of this, I would look at where a valley, where there was a gap in a valley. So a valley swims along the surface and then stops, and then it kind of trickles out the other side. Well, what's the reason for that? And almost every single time when I looked at it on the topography, there was a hole right between that area. And when I mapped it, I could find different levels of possible lakes within that hole. And when I did this over and over again across the whole surface, not only did I find lakes, but it actually linked all of these valleys into systems of lakes and valleys draining across the entire surface for hundreds of kilometers. And just to, just to look at it in detail on this one, you can even put together a sequence of events of how this happened. So first a lake at the top would have filled and then overflowed to fill the next lake, which then overflowed and eroded down to fill the next, and the next. And then in this case, it flowed onwards from that into what might have been an ocean, because I found this huge delta right on the edge of that line between the north and south of the planet. And when I did this across the entire study area, that there had been 20 lakes found, I actually found almost 800 lakes in that area. And this isn't, this isn't to say the previous work was wrong or they didn't do it well enough. It just takes time. All of this takes time. And this is what science is, is just putting in your one little puzzle piece so that maybe the next person will do a similar study somewhere else on the planet and find the same thing. That's the hope, at least. So you just, we pick away at it. But I think this is a really good suggestion that there was probably a lot more water on Mars than we actually realized. So if that's the case, if, if Mars was really wet and it had an ocean, this is the study area that I was looking at, by the way. This is a beautiful, uh, this is an artist's impression of the surface of Mars when it might have had oceans and lakes. But if that's the case, well, maybe, maybe there is life. Maybe there was life. It seems pretty certain. But there is a catch with all of this. And that is, what type of life are we actually looking for on Mars? Do we think we'll find the fossils of something the size of a dinosaur? Do we think we'll find fossil shells? Do we think we'll find archaeology of an intelligent species that lived there? To get, to, to get around this, I'm going to show you some of the, a slide from my other research project. I've been working on proving that there is life on Earth. 
This first one, this evidence, exhibit A we'll call it, is evidence from my kitchen that there's life on Earth. Ignore the vegetables in the background. What I want you to see is the flame. The simple fact that you can light a flame on Earth shows that there's oxygen in the atmosphere. And to have that much free oxygen in the atmosphere, the only way that we know that that can happen is by photosynthesis, by plants taking carbon dioxide and making oxygen. And that's the only way any animals like us can actually breathe. But it also, it's also the only way you can actually have a fire on the surface of our, of our planet. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an indication that there's biochemical signs of, Earth, of life on Earth. If you want to look a little bit bigger than that, just look at a local pond. If you see a green kind of scum at the bottom of the pond, that's a photosynthetic algae. So you wouldn't be able to actually see the individual cells, but you know that something's there. You know that that is life. For lack of a better word, let's call them macroorganisms. Anything from the size of a cow to a blue whale to a mouse, I found them. They're here. They're on Earth. Proof. Proof that there's life on Earth. With some arguments, we could even say that there's intelligent life on Earth. I won't get into that too much. But that's great, right? We know that there's life on Earth. That's incredible. But what if, what if Earth wasn't as full of life as, as it is today? What might we look for if there was maybe life here in the past, but no more? Well, in terms of biochemistry, this is a picture I took of the tar pits in Los Angeles. And this is an area where oil and gas bubble to the surface of the planet and are released into this really gross pond. But that's evidence that there was life in the past, that lots of small little sea creatures died a very long time ago, and their bodies all sank to the bottom of the sea and were buried, and then at some point, they were, that, the sludge that came out of those bodies was released, and it comes to the surface as a biochemical sign that there was life here before. For microorganisms, it's a lot harder to tell. It's a lot harder to see these things. But we get these things called stromatolites, where it's essentially algae has built up over years and years and years, trapped sand and silt as it was growing, and you get rocks with really fine layers. It might be hard to see in that, in that photo, but you get big mound-shaped rocks actually formed by microorganisms. Macroorganisms, everyone's familiar with that. Dinosaur bones, sea creatures, fossils like this, those are all signs of life previous to us, but on the Earth. And then you can even see archaeology. You can even see signs of where people had built things in the past, but don't live anymore. So we'll divide this into extant life and extinct life. So coming back to it, what, are we, what kinds of life now are we looking for on Mars? What types of evidence of this, of these options, do we think we might find? Not to be a downer, but really, we're only thinking this is the types of life and signs of life we might find on Mars. And I know that might be disappointing. We all want Martian dinosaurs. But this is still very exciting if we find life. But it's going to be something subtle like this, probably, if we find it. And there's a pretty good reason for this. Earth and Mars both formed at about the same time, about four and a half billion years ago. And as far as we understand, for both planets, pretty shortly, maybe about uh, half a billion years after they were formed, the surface was cool enough and there was enough liquid on the surface that they both formed oceans and thick atmospheres. Now on the Earth, these conditions pretty much lasted all the way to the present day. And that's great. That's great for us. That's great for life on Earth, that it's been so stable over those four billion years that it's been very nice here. Not so much with Mars. Mars cooled down very quickly at about three billion years ago and became very cold and very dry, very much like the place we see it today. So if we really simplify this, we look at it in terms of what water was like on the surface during this time. So Earth has a whole stretch of about four billion years when there was life or when there was water on the surface. Mars, probably only about a billion years. So all those examples I showed you of rivers on Mars and lakes and oceans, 
that's constrained to this really limited period of time, about a billion years. And here's the big catch. When we look at how life evolved on Earth, amazingly, simple, simple forms of life, like bacteria, evolved really quickly as soon as there was water on the surface. But then, it takes a couple billion years before you even get things with cells and nuclei. And then, it's another billion and a half years after that before you get life forms that are actually multicellular, and we see lots of those on the surface. After that, in the last half a billion years, which for a geologist is just a blink of an eye, it all, change, it all happens very fast. You get dinosaurs, and then right at the end, we have humans. So this is the reason when we're looking for life on Mars, we don't think we're going to find an advanced alien civilization. Probably, if, it evo if life evolved on Mars anything like it did on Earth, we're probably only going to find those really simple, simple life forms. Now, that's not, that's not a bad thing at all. It's still very exciting to find life that evolved independent from the Earth anywhere. But how do we find these really subtle signs? Well, the ExoMars mission, launching in 2016, excuse me, 2018, no, 2020. Uh, no, there was a problem with a parachute then. Uh, September, September this year. Oh, Russia. <sighs> Unfortunately, this is one of the most exciting missions planned in recent years is going to Mars, and it just keeps getting delayed. Everything has to be exactly right for one of these missions. And unfortunately, we're just going to have to wait a bit longer. But this is one of the first missions to be designed specifically to find actual signs of life on Mars in the places that we think it would be most likely to find it. And that is that it's going to be the first to drill into the surface up to two meters down to get away to, from all the really harsh conditions on the surface of Mars to see what it's like where it might be safer, protected from radiation, from the cold environment on the surface. And this is, two meters is huge. That drill hole that I showed you that Curiosity made is about a, mil, uh, about a centimeter deep. And that's, that's as far as we can go on Mars at the moment. This would be huge. And it's also going to have a lot of analysis equipment on it to test really carefully for the type of biosignatures, really simple chemicals, that might be signs that there was life in the past. Another advance that's on, in the works at the moment, the Perseverance rover, is also going to help with this. And it's doing something, all, again, completely new in the history of Mars research. As it goes along, it's doing a lot of science on whatever rocks it finds. It pokes at them. It shoots lasers at some of them. And, but in addition to that, it's actually saving some of the best samples. It has little test tubes. And it finds some of the best samples. It puts a little core of rock in there. And it leaves it on the surface. And the plan is that in a few years, we're actually going to send another rover to go pick up all those samples, fetch them together, put them in a rocket on the surface of Mars, launch it up into Mars orbit, and then have it meet a satellite that also needs to be built and go to Mars. And it's, they're going to meet up, and it's going to put all the sa samples in there safely, bring it back to Earth orbit, and then drop it down into the Earth on a parachute. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so simple. It is, it is, it's mind-blowing to me that, that this is going to work. But the foresight of these missions is incredible. We're collecting the samples now to be picked up by a rover that's not even been built yet. And it's not going to launch until at least 2028. This is the planning that goes into these space missions. And unfortunately, we all just have to have, to have patience with this. But having said all that, it's an incredibly exciting time for the search for life in our solar system. We have these two really advanced missions on Mars. And despite the difficulties I mentioned about getting to the outer solar system, there's actually been a mission approved to go to Titan. It would be a small helicopter drone about the size of a car, I believe, that's going to zip around and see different places around these methane lakes. There's going to be one that goes to Europa in a few years, and a couple missions going to uh, Venus in the next decade. So it's a great time to look for life in the solar system.
So keep your eyes on this. And I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Even if we don't find life or signs of life with any of these missions, that's an incredible result in itself. And to paraphrase uh, a famous uh, sci-fi author, either we're alone in the universe or we're not. Each is equally terrifying. Thank you very much. <laughs>